In the last video on sensor fusion, we had a look at why we even need sensor fusion, as well as looking at individual sensors such as accelerometers and gyroscopes to see the problems they have when we're, for example, interested in estimating something like the attitude of an aircraft, that is, maybe the roll and pitch angles. In this second video, we will cover the first sensor fusion technique, which is very computationally efficient and used in many simple applications, and this is called the complementary filter. If you'd like to find the little brain board design files as well as the source code I'm using in these videos, you can go to my GitHub repository at github.com slash pms67, navigate to the little brain STM32F4 sensor board directory, and you can find all the firmware, the RTOS firmware, all the libraries, schematics, and KiCad design files and so forth. Thank you also to Altium for sponsoring this video. I use Altium for my work and for more complicated projects for PCB designs, hardware designs, and so forth. Altium is actually offering a free trial of Altium Designer. And if you can go to altium.com slash yt slash fills lab, you can get a free trial for yourself to see what Altium Designer is all about. In this video, we'll look at the first sensor fusion technique, which is called the complementary filter. I would suggest you watch the previous video, but I'll do a quick recap here. Then we'll look at complementary filter theory, and that is to estimate the roll and pitch using an inertial measurement unit that contains gyroscopes and accelerometers. And then we'll actually see the implementation of this complementary filter on an STM32 microcontroller, which is connected to an IMU. In the previous video, we looked at what sensor fusion is and why we might need it. In particular, we looked at individual sensors and saw that they had some problems. For example, the accelerometer measures all types of acceleration, so we can only really get valid estimates of roll and pitch when our system is at rest, that is, we're measuring gravity. The other sensors we looked at were gyroscopes, and these essentially only give us valid estimates of a change in angle over short periods of time. And this is due to something called gyro drift, which I explained in the previous video. Now we want to know how we can actually combine these measurements to improve our roll and pitch estimates. Remember, roll was denoted by the Greek letter phi and pitch by theta. Instead of focusing on the problems of each sensor, we'll actually try to exploit the benefits of them. The accelerometer, roughly speaking, is good for long-term compensation. We can use it to null the gyroscope bias drift or rather compensate for that gyro drift. On the other hand, the gyroscope is pretty good for short-term use. That is, if we only launch it in a very short amount of time, the drift won't affect us, and we can use that information to calculate our new angle estimate. The idea is then to merge these two benefits, and that gives us the complementary filter. Now here's a complementary filter block diagram, and don't worry, we'll go through everything step by step. We have two branches to this complementary filter. One at the top here, which is to do with the accelerometer, and one at the bottom here, which is to do with the gyroscope. And at the end, we do our merging step, but let's go through it one by one. Essentially, we take the accelerometer data. From that, we assume the system is at rest, just for simplicity. And then we try to estimate phi and theta, the roll and pitch angles, using the accelerometer values only. We then multiply it by some constant called alpha, which is typically mean 0 and 1, and I'll explain later what that means. On the other hand, with a gyroscope, we get the measurements. We transform the body to Euler rates, which is explained in the previous video, which gives us phi dot and theta dot, so the angular rates of change. Then we actually integrate these measurements. So we multiply these phi dot and theta dot roll and pitch rates by t, which is our sample time in seconds. And we use the feedback from the output of our complementary filter, which is our angle estimate, and add that to that change in angle. But we'll go through that in more detail. Then we multiply that integral by one minus alpha. And finally, we sum those two branches together. So from the accelerometer and from the gyroscope to give our angle estimates over here. But let's go through this in detail again. Starting with the accelerometer, we use the accelerometer model from the previous video and assume our system is not accelerating. That is, we are only sensing gravity along each of these axes. We collect the measurements at a fixed sample time, capital T, which is in seconds, and we apply a digital low-pass filter to remove some of that high-frequency noise that is superimposed on our signal. Our final measurement vector is then given by A, which contains AX, AY, and AZ in meters per second squared, and that measures the acceleration along each axis. Then again, assuming that the system is at rest, not accelerating, we can then estimate our roll and pitch angles using these formula. So the arctan of AY over AZ is our roll, and the arc sine of AX over G, which is the gravitational constant at the Earth's surface, roughly 9.81 meters per second squared. We will then later combine these accelerometer angle measurements with the gyroscope angle measurements. But first, let's look at the gyroscope. Again, the gyroscope readings are in the body frame in radians per second. 
So we're measuring our angular rates of change along each body frame axis, P, Q, and R. We're doing this at a fixed sampling time T, again, the same sampling time as the accelerometer in seconds. Then we apply a digital low pass filter and optionally a very, very low cutoff high pass filter to try to aid with the bias drift. Then of course, we need to transform to the Euler rates. So we go from the body rates, P, Q, R, multiply by this matrix, and then go to phi dot and theta dot to get our Euler rates. Then it is time to combine the data. And this is the essence of the complementary filter. Here's the formula for the complementary filter and I'll go through this one by one. On the left-hand side, which is our output of the complementary filter is for example, our angle estimate. So this is roll or pitch. This is equal to our accelerometer estimate, which we calculated two slides ago, multiplied by this constant alpha, which is between zero and one. The angle estimate is some sort of combination of the accelerometer estimate plus an estimate using the gyroscope. And the gyroscope estimate uses the previous angle estimate, which is the output, the previous output of the complementary filter. We add to that the change in angle, which is the sample time times our roll rate or pitch rate. This whole term here is then the time integral, which gives us our current angle estimate using the output of the complementary filter as well as the gyroscope. Then we merge this accelerometer data with this gyroscope integral. And depending on how we select alpha, we either prefer the accelerometer estimate or we prefer the gyroscope estimate. Now this is just done for roll, but of course we can do the same thing for our theta, which is our pitch. Now alpha has cropped up quite a bit. The question is what does alpha do and how do we actually choose it? Again, alpha is some sort of constant between zero and one. Essentially, it tells us how much do we trust the accelerometer estimates. So if alpha is close to zero, we will prefer the gyro integral. And if alpha is close to one, we'll prefer the gravity-based accelerometer estimates. Typically, you will find that alpha is very close to zero, something like 0 0.02, 0 0.05. The accelerometer is essentially just there to compensate for the gyro drift rather than to provide an actual angle estimate. As usual, we need to think of some practical considerations. As we saw on the slide to actually estimate theta dot and phi dot, our roll and pitch rates, we need to know phi and theta to do that body rate to Euler rate transformation. We may also need to low pass filter the final estimates. So once we have the angle estimates, we might want to apply an additional low pass filter. There are some computationally expensive operations, for example, the sine, cosine, or tan. We could maybe use a better integration method. Right now we're just using a simple oil integration, but we could use trapezoidal or something like that. Also initialization. Maybe it'd be a good idea to actually guess our initial angle, for example, using the accelerometer, and then feed that in as our starting point for the complementary filter. A big question is how do we choose alpha? And we'll look at that later on. Also, we are applying low and maybe high pass filters to our measurements, that is the raw accelerometer and raw gyroscope data. The question is how much do we filter them? How do we choose our cutoff frequencies and so forth? These are just some examples and we won't be covering most of these in this video, but it's something to think about for your own implementations. But now let's go over and implement this on a real time embedded system. I'll be using an STM32 microcontroller and a BMI 088 inertial measurement unit, which contains accelerometers and gyroscopes. I have this on my little brain board, which I mentioned at the beginning of this video. And please see the channel for more videos on drivers, STM32 setup and so forth covering that board. So here we are on STM32 Cube IDE, and I'd suggest you watch the previous videos on how I set up this board. I've defined my complementary filter up here, and for now I've set it to 0.05. Down here, the main code for the complementary filter is in my while loop, which runs continuously. Essentially, I run at my fixed sample time over here, which is about 10 milliseconds. In that, I can compute my complementary filter, as well as print my results, my angle estimates via USB as a virtual COM port. But let's go through it step by step. Initially, I start with my, the accelerometer part. So I get my filtered accelerometer measurements, that is AX, AY, and AZ, all meters per second squared. Then I estimate the angles just via the accelerometer measurements. That's just taken from the slides. So I'm taking the arctan and the arc sine, and I've just implemented that right here. That's the accelerometer part. The next part is the gyroscope. So again, I get my filtered gyroscope measurements, P, Q, and R. That is in my body frame. I have to transform my body rates to the Euler rates which you can see in the previous video as well, and again in the slides. And all, that's all I'm doing here. Then I get my phi dot and theta dot in radians per second, and that's the gyroscope part. Now here comes the actual complementary filter part. And this is once for the roll angle and once for the pitch angle. All I'm doing is implementing this equation over here. So an angle estimate is some combination of the accelerometer estimate plus the integral of the gyro. I have my complementary filter alpha times my accelerometer angle estimate and the complement of my alpha, so one minus alpha times the integral of my gyro. 
So it's my previous complementary filter estimate. Added to that, I am doing the sample time t in seconds times my Euler rate of the roll angle in this case and the pitch angle on the lower case. And that's really all there is to it. Then I do the same for my theta and print the results via the virtual COM port, transforming radians to degrees as well as a final step, but all the previous calculations were in radians. Now, of course, this is the most basic implementation of a complementary filter you can imagine. There's many tweaks you can add to this, but let's check this out running on the STM32. Again, I'm using the serial oscilloscope and I'll leave a link to that in the description. Let me just plot the data coming in. So you can see red and green roll and pitch angles. I have it flying flat on my desk. You can see this is in degrees on the y-axis and that's about minus one and minus 0 0.8. Given the accuracy of the accelerometers, gyroscopes and so forth, this is pretty good. And who knows if my table is level anyway. So it's not drifting, as you can see, we're staying pretty much at the same roll and pitch angles, which is great. So it looks like we've eliminated the bias drift, at least over this time window. And now let me start rolling the board. So that's the green trace. And you can see my pitch angle pretty much stays the same. And I put my board back flat on the table. And again, it's about minus one degree, which is okay, which is pretty much the offset we saw at the beginning. So we can rotate and pitch the board and it returns back to the initial angle we have, which is the angle of my desk, which seems to be about minus one degree. I can of course pitch as well, and my roll angle shouldn't move, I can pitch up and down. I'm trying not to roll, but of course this is my human error. And as you can see, I put it back on the desk and it returns and converges back to my initial stationary angle. So this is pretty good. It looks like the complementary filter is working. However, if I try to, for example, your my board, that is not roll and pitch, you can see the accelerometer still has quite a bit of an influence. If my axis here, it makes the board think it's rolled and pitched by plus minus two degrees. So it's a lot better than we had without this sensor fusion, but still this is a, is a problem we haven't accounted for with our simple accelerometer model. But overall, the roll and pitch estimates seem to be fairly decent for such a simple implementation. Now that we've seen the complementary filter in action and seen that it does its job reasonably well, I would like to just present to you an alternative view of the complementary filter in a more classical control theory sense. It actually is a state observer. I won't go into detail what this is and I will provide some links in the description relating to state observers. Essentially, if we have a linear time invariant state space model, such as this one here, our state vector is denoted by X, which contains theta and phi, and that is essentially some sort of state transition matrix times our current state vector plus some control input matrix times an input vector. In our case, we can fill in all these matrices. We have our state vector, our state transition matrix, our input matrix, and our inputs in quotes, so to speak, are phi dot and theta dot, which are the transformed body to Euler rates from the gyroscope. The most simple observer is called Lunberger observer, and this means we need actually to apply a correction term to this. So if we're just using this, this is essentially just using the gyroscope information to update the state vector. But we'd like to incorporate the accelerometer, and we can do that via this correction term L. So here is our normal model, but then if we add our correction term, which is essentially the difference between our current state vector and our estimate from the accelerometer. Estimate from the accelerometer, we do via our gravity model again. And L can be comprised of, for example, a diagonal matrix with alpha as its elements. And essentially this is then the complementary filter alpha. So this is trying to show that the complementary filter is nothing other than a simple Lundberger state observer and quite a nice alternative view to the one that's usually presented. Now the question becomes what actually is the optimal way of choosing the matrix L or rather alpha. And we would like to estimate the optimal way of doing this at every time step. And that actually leads quite nicely to the common filter, which is exactly what that is used for. And we'll look at that more in detail in the next video. So thank you for watching.